Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, this is uh, the largest we ever had for this course of multimodal machine learning. I'm very excited uh, to start this new semester. Um, this is uh, the probably about sixth time we teach this course, but we made some changes this year. This will be the first time that this course is uh, recorded completely uh, remotely, uh, is done completely remotely. If at any point you have a question, uh, I very welcome questions. Since it is a very large uh, group of people, what I will ask each of you is uh, to type questions. Uh, this will work uh, much better. So type any questions. We have uh, the, um, uh, the TAs who are monitoring this. Um, they may, in fact, answer directly the question, uh, if it is, uh, via chat, or um, if uh, not, then it will notify me and we can address that. So, um, so I want to start uh, right now. Uh, this uh, season, we have uh, five TAs that are going to work with us uh, for this. I'm very happy to have all five. They were handpicked um, to be... Uh, people who have experience in multimodal, uh, either by taking this course and or doing research directly on this topic. Paul is a TA and at the same time will be guest lecturer on a few lectures, uh, specifically uh, reinforcement learning. And I'm very excited that he accepted to give uh, a few of these lectures. The rest of time will be me giving lectures. And at the end, we'll have a few more guest lecturer uh, we have uh, Prakar, uh, also Martin, Shikib, and Torsten. I think at least right now we have Martin and Paul who are uh, somewhere in that list of 120 plus people who are currently uh, on, the, on this. So, um, yeah. So today my goal uh, is first to share my passion about multimodal. Uh, I'm definitely passionate on this topic and you will see it through my lecture. Um, I want to give you a definition of multimodal, uh, what is multimodal, uh, a historical view, and also share these five technical challenges that are involved in many of the multimodal research and give you details on the syllabus. Um, what is multimodal? And normally at this point, I will try to get answers from you. And uh, I did not manage to get the... Uh, the um, the polls uh, functionality of Zoom to work right now, so it will be without the poll. But what is multimodal? What is a definition? Sometimes we can think of multimodal as uh, from a mathematical perspective. A math multimodal could be seen, in fact, one of the first, although not the first, first one, but one of the first definition of multimodal was really a multimodal distribution, multimodal mode of, uh, of a distribution, like the peak. Um, but often when we think of multimodal, it is a lot more related to sensory modalities, uh, the sound, the touch, uh, and the speech. Uh, the um, what you see and so all of these are the sensory. I myself have done a lot of research over the years uh, on, a, on a part of this which is the uh, a subset of these modalities although I'm excited in multimodal machine learning in general uh, I, I have a focus myself on a, um, on a subset of them and three of them that I we will be focusing a lot more uh, in this course, but in general, uh, that are, are very uh, central to communication. Uh, I call them the three V of communication, verbal, vocal, and visual. What you see, how you say it, uh, and, sorry, what you say, how you say it, and also the visual, the behavior. So verbal, the words, how you phrase them, but also the intent behind the words are very important. The vocal, is one part is the prosody. Prosody is related to uh, what you um, what you say, the words, how you say the words. That's one aspect. But there's also what's called vocal expression, like a laughter or a pause fillers. Um, all of these are part of vocal. They are kind of the nonverbal aspect of uh, of, um, of visual. So. 
this is uh, one uh, aspect of this. And then the, the third one is visual, the gestures, the beat gestures like I'm doing, body language, proxemics, although proxemics in the virtual world mean almost something different. Um, and if you ask me, one of the important cue I look in all communication is eye gaze. I, uh, it's a very important cue both from communication perspective, but also cognitively when you're talking and thinking uh, finally, facial expression, very important. So that these are three examples. In a second, I'm going to give you a lot, much larger number of that. But before I give in the specific of different modalities, there's a difference between, you've heard maybe the term sometime multimodal and multimedia. Uh, and, and you're like, oh, what's the difference? Um, a modality and a medium are different, although very related. The modality is the way in which something happened in his experience. This is, in a sense, almost the content of it. Uh, the medium is the mean in, in the, the way it is stored and communicated. So you can see there is a big relationship in this audio being a medium, you could say, and, and the vocal being a modality. Over the years, multimodal and multimedia had so much overlap that people started using the terms back and forth. And so you will see them use multimedia and multimodal. But I just wanted to give you originally how these came from. And when you think of multimodal, you have to think of multidisciplinary. This is something that comes from many different fields all bringing together. Uh, in a sense, it's, it's uh, almost AI coming together because there's the speech, the vision, the language. There's also maybe the tactile and the robotics. There's the aspect of learning and there are applications and the knowledge to gain from medical and psychology. Um, so I mentioned natural language, visual and auditory or verbal, visual and vocal. There's also the touch. Uh, if you look at these days, we also have to those uh, sensors a lot of sensors to the cell phone. Uh, you have in medical field, the EEG, uh, and you also have infrared um, cameras sometimes in some sensors and we also have fMRI. The course, as I mentioned, will focus on language and vision uh, as two of the building blocks for a lot of our, uh, of our examples, but a lot of the work we talk about uh, will in fact also uh, uh, have application other modalities and as often as possible I will try to bring these uh, other example uh, modalities uh, in there so so the historical view I just want because sometimes you talk with students and sometimes we with uh, the world of archive and and we kind of think that the the science, everything that's more than five or 10 years old is, is too old to read. Uh, so I, I, I would like to think of multimodal as something that really evolved over the years. And I think there's a lot of value in looking behind, uh, looking at previous work. I, from my experience in multimodal, I, from my study of it, there's four eras of multimodal. Um, there is the era of behavioral. A lot of the work there was psychology inspired or communication inspired. I will give you one, a few example on this very interesting work. I strongly suggest to look at some of this early work. And then there's something magic in late, uh, in middle to late eighties where suddenly it's no more just looking at multimodal behavior from, uh, from a maybe a psychological or linguistic perspective, but certainly looking at computational uh, approach. One of them is uh, looking at audiovisual speech recognition. And sometime in 2000, and I'll give you like uh, probably one of the reasons for that, uh, but there's a, there's a switch where it's not just looking at a, a human in a computer, but suddenly multimodal look at multi people and their social interaction. And so there is a lot of emphasis on social interaction. And in 2010-ish, uh, then there's a sudden move uh, in looking at those neural architecture, like the renewal of neural architectures that started almost 2006, 2007, but really had a big grasp uh, around 2010. The course is focusing a lot more on that part, but I think it's healthy to look at it uh, more generally as well. So 
Um, if you have to read one, and it's hard to pick only one person uh, to read, but I, I, if you had to look at these, uh, this era, and he's done work uh, in the 1990s, but I'm, I'm just putting some on 80s. David McNeil, I love his work very much on language and gesture. And, and he's done a lot of interesting work that looking at gesture are, in fact, a, a display of people's thoughts. And so, so it's, it's more than just something that accompanied the speech. It is a clear uh, uh, depiction of the thoughts. And, and there's a very interesting uh, debate around language and gestures around there. And our own uh, faculty here at CMU, Justine Kessel, worked very closely with David McNeil back in the days. Um, I will say there's this magic moment where suddenly we went from uh, we went from um, uh, we went from psychological linguistic to uh, 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 sorry to psychology and uh, and linguistic to more computational approach. And I think one of these is that really sparked interest is the McGurk effect. Uh, I'm going to play the videos maybe some of you have seen in the past. The McGurk effect, so you have to listen and watch the video. Uh, so if you're looking at something at the same time, uh, it's not going to work. So this time you need to look at the video. Um, and listen, I'm going to play two clips and you have to see if you hear something different in both cases. Ba. Ba, 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 ba. Okay, so this was the first slip. So hopefully you heard something uh, repeated over and over. It sounds really simple. Um, I'm going to play it again. Uh, no, not the same clip, a second clip, uh, and listen if you hear something different. Ba. Ba, 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 ba. What's really interesting, for the few of you who didn't bother to even look at it, you probably in fact heard the same thing both times. And the reason for that is it's exactly the same audio clip. It's exactly the same audio clip in both cases. The only difference is the video in both of them. Uh, in one case, you probably, the first one heard something closer to ba, 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 and the second is pa, pa, pa. So you can see that suddenly it's very exciting. Something like, oh my God, we were doing all this work on speech recognition. There was interesting work uh, in the 80s on this and like, but but then and, and like the, oh but maybe the whole reason that uh, uh, this uh, was not working well it was that we needed to have both audio and video together and that's why in the the next phase is computational I think suddenly what what drove a lot of it one of the thing not the only thing but one of the main thing that drove the computational era is this audiovisual speech recognition this idea that to recognize things you need to be able to uh, look uh, and uh, hear and look at the same time. One thing that was interesting during this era is that it turned out that although it is effectively helping, it looks like audio and visual could help uh, together in a few cases, it turned out in the case of speech recognition, there's a lot of redundancy. Both signals are encoding the same thing which is great, which makes things in fact more robust. And so one of the things to take home for all the research on audiovisual speech recognition is that sometime bringing the two modalities together, the goal may be to uh, have something more robust and you can have redundant information in both modality. You could have also complementary, like you need to have both modalities to be able to infer like the fa, 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 but in, in most cases, uh, you can also find um, that uh, only one modality may be sufficient. Now, at the same time, when this old work happened in audiovisual speech recognition, in the world of human computer interaction, there's suddenly a lot of interest in multimodal because human, how will a human ever interact with a computer? 
it should be the same way as the human interact with each other. And human interact with each other with through multiple modalities. So there's a lot of interest at this point to build computers. Now these days, we almost see it as a reality coming up with these different uh, interface, Alexa being one of them. Um, but now we have these assistants, but there we're talking about more than 20 plus years ago, uh, there was already this dream of this. And one of the uh, sub dream of that was effective computing where it's not only you talk with a robot, but there's also the aspect of emotion and feeling that we'll be able to uh, perceive and generate and model. And if you wonder why emotion, emotions are key to decision making. There's a lot of work in this and a lot of literature on this topic, but if for decision making, emotions are key. But they are also key for other things, like sharing emotions, sharing how you're feeling. So the emotions are important in a different aspect. The, the third thing there was multimedia. These happen all around the same time. A little bit later, I will say multimedia computing. Multimedia computing was the idea of all of these videos that was being created digitally. And can we understand its content so that we cannot just, we don't, we don't just research things based on keywords, but we can use the content of the video. And it was a very big landmark project that was almost 15 years uh, at Carnegie Mellon. Alex Hoffman was one uh, of the co-PI on this. Um, so this is, fun. this is great because at that point, the, it was the beginning of the internet. Now it sounds so obvious with things like YouTube or even Facebook and other platform that we want to search videos, but this was really at the beginning of it. And so they want to look at the content inside the video, the speech, the image, and the language in it. So this is 2000, and then suddenly we go ahead and it's what I would call the interaction era. At this point, we want to model human-human interaction as well. And one landmark project, I will say, is the AMI project in early 2000. They recorded meetings moving together, uh, people talking to each other. So it, it was no more just human computer, uh, and it was a lot more... Uh, looking at people, how they interact together. There was a follow-up to that also uh, with uh, faculty at CMU Chill. Um, by the way, if you know Benjo uh, from uh, Montreal and his, frere, uh, his and his brother, Sammy, Sammy was in fact on the AMI project. I think it was as a postdoc uh, back in the days. I think he was recently at Google, if I remember correctly, um, uh, Sammy. Uh, so just to give an example, uh, another very big important one, um, for everybody who has an iPhone, you know about Siri, but Siri came from this multimodal project that uh, it was a DARPA funded project called Kalo about this personal assistant, this whole idea of bringing information together. Um, and around the same time, social signal processing, although it's, the, the term itself started in the US, it had a big momentum in Europe uh, around that time. So a lot of very interesting project. And then suddenly, uh, and then suddenly we come into the deep learning. And why is the deep learning era so important for multimodal? Because they, there's some landmark work and I, I've, I've listed some of them, uh, that landmark work, but really the key enabler, why suddenly the way we went from multimodal research before to, to a brand new paradigm of multimodal research. It is from at least four different reasons. The first two are, I will say, generic reason for many research topics. And the last two, I think, are a little bit more specific. The first one is that suddenly that we had a much larger number of multimodal data set. I talk about the AMI data set. There's a lot of other one, uh, audiovisual emotion challenges being other example, but suddenly there's a move towards much larger data set. Um, so that's one point. And the other point that you probably heard often and over and over is also about faster computer and GPUs that allowed us to revisit uh, theories and, and models back from the 90s and re, uh, restudy them now in this larger scale uh, 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 scenarios. And so, yes, these were definitely very important, but I think what really made the difference is two things. Um, 
If you think of multimodal and specifically look at language, vision, and maybe audio as well, um, vision is was a very high dimensional and, and many modalities have the same issue, very high dimensional. Um, and it, the way to represent it was I had always been somewhat of a challenge. There were some very interesting uh, features that were like more local in space, like SIF feature back in 2000. But suddenly with neural representation and re the revisiting of convolutional, suddenly you take these very high dimensional representation and put them in a one vector or one representation um, that is much smaller that allow to take both the spatial information and the texture information and encode that in that one vector. So that was very nice. That happened uh, one landmark paper in 2011, if I remember correctly. And around the same time, a lot of interesting approaches that were studied in the past about a distributional hypothesis, meaning the meaning of a word can be approximated by the words surrounding it, got revisited by researchers around the world, but specifically by Google researchers was one of the landmark word with word to vec And so then Lee, you could take what was very discrete, very discrete elements like words, and suddenly you were able to encode them into something that like a vector representation, as some people would call the word to vec vectors. So now we had something that was very discrete and we can put it in a vector representation. We have an image that was high dimensional. You can put it in a vector. And then in speech, I would say these, there was a lot of work in the past and they had already found very useful representations that could already be used. Although they, you see some newer one recently, but they're still already at a good understanding looking at the frequency domain, looking at spectrogram, or even at how people are hearing and looking at MFCC. So all these modalities now are all on the same similar, and they're not exactly the same space because you have to remember the kind of noise you see in an image is very different from the kind of noise you see in words. Like in a word, you may have a mistake in the way something has been uh, transcribe or something like this, but in the words, we're talking about pixel, change of textures, so very different model of noise. And so it's not that these space are equivalent, but they are a lot closer. So we went from very heterogeneous to less heterogeneous. It's still different space, but they are a little bit closer. And so that really brought and the uh, multimodal deep learning and some of the follow-up papers to try to study these. And that's what we're gonna study in this course today. So when we study multimodal, you're probably wondering like, is it, why do I do study multimodal machine learning? Why not just studying machine learning? I mean, if it's in the, word, it's in the name and probably everything we study in machine learning is exactly what we need in multimodal. When we started teaching this course, uh, and I like more than six years ago, we, the goal was to, to study what exists in machine learning and what exists in multimodal research and try to identify what is the core challenges, what are the core ch technical challenges in multimodal that have been understudied in machine learning. It doesn't mean they're never studied, but they've been kind of understudied in machine learning. And so uh, we identified uh, five of these core challenges and I'm gonna highlight them during this lecture today and we're gonna use it kind of as a structure for this course. Uh, we're gonna go way beyond that eventually because this uh, survey, for example, was a survey of three years ago. So, but it's interesting if you do a survey and you talk about taxonomy, of research, it's interesting that although the, there's a lot of new papers that came in, the taxonomy, some of it is still very relevant these days and a lot of it is still relevant. I think we can always expand, but it's a good starting point, I think, when you're studying multimodal. So let me go in this uh, and study what those core challenges are. Right now, I'm not going to give, I'm going to give an overview and we're going to spend the next uh, 15 weeks together looking in the details and looking at state of the art that way go, go beyond that. So 
but two of the core challenges, I think, uh, for many problems, but also for multimodal, is how do you bring verbal, vocal, and visual? And at a first level, is very important, and I think everybody who's used or work now these days with deep neural representation or networks really understand the challenge of representation learning. And so I think there's some very key aspects that are true um, for in general of representation learning. But in multimodal, I'm going to share with you a few um, uh, core challenges related to representations. If you ask me what is this one challenge that is very multimodal is alignment. And I'm gonna give a little, bit more, a little bit more details in a second looking at uh, uh, synchrony. But let me talk about multimodal. And I have a dream and I had this dream for a while. Uh, and this dream uh, is that um, I could learn a representation where if I say I like it or I'm, I'm a happy face or joyful tone, that the representation will uh, encode that similarity, or if I if I'm tense, or if I'm uh, or if I'm surprised, that these will be able that my representation will encode that at some level. And this is a, a dream that I had for a while. Um, and I will say we're a lot closer to that. But back in the days, this dream called as more than 15 years old. This dream. But what happened in this 2010, 11 and plus is that suddenly that dream become a lot more reality. And what, what happened is that they, people were suddenly able to learn joint representation, representation when, where you see an object is a visual representation. And then you see, you, you see, you see some language associated with this. So maybe a red car or, uh, an enthusiastic purse speaker uh, or, or some. So you have a kind of a description and, the, and so you have some kind of pair data. And so a joint representation allows you to learn this one space where both of them will live together. And that sounded like almost impossible before, but now with this work and now we've seen a lot more of that, we got, this, we got to see these joint representations see a very important milestone. And one of the example I'm gonna show on the next slide is here's what they did and I, I love it. And I, I, I always talk about this one example is that they learn back in the days, uh, they learn uh, through a pair data set where you have pair image and description and they learn a joint representation. A representation could be just a vector. Um, and what's great by the, having it joint is that suddenly you can take any sentence and, and if the model was successful in, in, in training, you can take any of these uh, sentences and, and encode it, pass it through the, your model and suddenly get your representation, your vector. And you could do it similarly with any image and both will be in the same space, in the same kind of representation. And what can you do if you do this is great. What did they do? They did and they trained the model and then they test, and then what they do? They take an image of a blue car, a blue car, and then they go and encode it, like kind of get a vector out of it with their model that they had trained on other data. And then they take the word blue, and then they also encode it, and then they create the word red and also encode it, and then they do arithmetic, which is beautiful. Uh, the blue car, of the image of a blue car, minus blue plus red, you get a new vector, and then you can sample from that, like your nearest neighbor, like look in your, all of the training data, uh, or you could have a calibration data set for that. And that's really interesting that suddenly you get images of red car. You could do it for colors, and then they did it for day and night, so you take a, a, a palace and then do it at night, flying and plus sailing. So, Although, uh, and we're gonna discuss these issues. I mean, uh, it, it, it doesn't mean that arithmetic is true every time there's cases this will fail, but just the fact that it worked in some cases was very exciting. I think this was, uh, for me, a big revelation. So, so then suddenly you have the chance um, to have multimodal representation. So representation, the challenge can be formalized as learning 
how to represent and summarize multimodal data in a way that explored the complementarity and redundancy. If you remember in audiovisual speech recognition, they turn out there's a lot of redundancy between the two, between what I say and my lips. There is a lot like my uh, visim, my phoneme, what you hear are similar to my visim, or like my lips uh, contour. So this is redundancy and you wanna take advantage of that redundancy maybe to be more efficient and more robust. But you also wanna do complementarity, like the McGurk effect. If two things uh, by themselves are not sufficient, like, and you need to bring them together. When you think of representation, many people think of joint representation. You take two modalities and you force them together in one representation, one vector space. There is, and I would like to make you think a little bit outside the box, a little bit with coordinated representation. That's a different way to think a little bit about uh, representation learning, where instead of bringing everything together, what you will do is bring each of them. So language, you have that representation, and then you'll have a visual and you, you have its own space. And instead of forcing them to be in the same one, you will keep them, but you're gonna coordinate a subspace, a, a sub part of it, you're gonna coordinate. And coordination, you should see it as a spectrum. Coordination is a, as a spectrum between that. So what do I mean by that? At one end, the coordination is so strong that they are equal. You're forcing it to be language representation being equal to visual representation. That's one end of it. So at that point, it's mostly a joint representation. At the other end, there's separate representation. You don't coordinate at all. And then you have a spectrum in between. One example is you could say, I'm not gonna make them equal, but I'm gonna make them correlated. So it's not as much as equal, but close. Uh, an example of that is CCA canonical correlation analysis. You could use that. Or you could go and say, uh, from all my representation, I'm gonna bring together only a subset of each representation. There's some items I want very close to each other. And for the rest, I will let you uh, let each uh, modality separate and let them by themselves. And we'll study different versions of these coordinated representation. As I mentioned, one thing that is core to multimodal is alignment, like synchrony. I talk and speak and gesture at the same time. You want to be able to align speech and gesture as an example. When I say it's very specific to, uh, to multimodal, alignment is in fact uh, what I, the generic term is multi-view. Multiple view of the same data. So multimodal, it could be seen as a specialization of multi-view learning uh, where the, the views are modalities but another way of multi-view is to also look at multilingual, multiple languages. These are all multi-view problems, multimodal, multilingual. And so that's why if some of you have studied machine translation, you will see the problem of alignment because this is a multi-view. You want to be in alignment. You want to be able to have elements of one modality like words or, or objects and be able to align them together and synchronize and align them. Some people will say when it's language and images will say even to ground them as an example. And when you do this, there's two types of alignment. There's the problem of explicit alignment or implicit alignment. Explicit alignment means your goal, your last function, your, your task is to align things together. Let's say I give you a corpora with a bunch of images and, and a bunch of text, and I say match them together, or a video and a cooking recipe. It's a video of the recipe and the cooking. I want to align that, or a, a wiki, like a to-do, uh, um, do-it-yourself video and the instruction, that kind of alignment. That's explicit alignment. The last function, what you're optimizing, is going to be the alignment. In many cases, the alignment is just an intermediate step. 
like the, the real loss function may be another task. It may be about generating text from an image. Uh, and so you go from the image to generating text. And in the middle, as a latent process, uh, you do implicit. And for people who work on this topic, the example of that would be an attention model, will be an example of implicit uh, or latent alignment. Uh, these days, we talk about self uh, attention, and transformers will all be in this thread. But there is often cases where your goal is I give you two videos and I want to align them together. That's probably the most visual of the example uh, I could give. So here's a, you have very, these videos originally were different time, number of different granularity. They're not exactly the same, but you're doing your best match to align them. Um, and you could, I could give you an image and you say, hey, the task is to align every word with every object or every possible word that you can with any object uh, in the image. But in many cases, the alignment is not explicit, but really the task is just the generation of language and implicitly as a latent state, you will do it. So this is representation and we're, we will spend about two full weeks, four lectures on representations. I think we have at least two lectures on alignment. Uh, these are very, very core aspect of the course. But then from there, there's a branch. From, from, from alignment, there's a branch. You either, you always, almost always have representation, almost always have alignment, but then there's a branch. Are you doing translation or are you doing fusion? There are a few examples where both are happening at the same time, but it's, it's, it's often, yeah, and their translation and fusion is about what is your loss function? What is your loss function? In the case of translation, what, what is, are you trying to do? Uh, and translation is translating from one modality to another. For example, translating from an image uh, to text, like for image captioning. Fusion, the loss function is not creating, generating one of the modality. In the case of fusion, you bring all the modalities together to be able to infer something else, something high level, like uh, uh, the recognizing the emotion or, or detecting an event in a video. So the fusion will be different and will bring different approaches than translation. So let me talk about translation at first and then talk about fusion. Translation, the landmark, and we'll talk a little bit more uh, on Thursday about this, but one of really the landmark work on translation was uh, image captioning. And I discussed that more uh, on, on, on Thursday. Um, but, uh, but there's more than that. There's different type of translations. And one of them that I like quite a bit is this example. In this example, uh, what you will see is on the, uh, I don't know if it's right or left for you, but on one side, the input side, what you have is from the video, we're only going to get the transcript of what has been said and the audio stream, like the acoustic, the vocal of the prosody. Only take that. And the goal is to generate the behaviors. And the behaviors, the visual gesture you want to generate, you're going to want to generate two types. The speaking gesture, if someone is talking, what, what do, does it look like? And the second one, if someone is listening, what are their gestures? And so uh, in this video that I'm about to play, um, when you see the virtual human, the appearance of the virtual human was designed to look a lot like the movie. That, that's, that's manually done. And the placement and the view angle was manually done. But the gesture themselves of the virtual human are all automatic uh, from the system. So it's a nice example uh, to that. Look, oh, sorry. You snotty little bastard. Your Honor, I'd like to ask for a recess. I'd like an answer to the question, Judge. The court will wait for an answer. If Lieutenant Kendrick gave an order that Santiago wasn't to be touched, then why did he have to be transferred? Colonel, Lieutenant Kendrick ordered the code red, didn't he? Because that's what you told Lieutenant Kendrick to do. Object! And when it went bad, you cut country. these guys loose! Your Honor, you had Marcus inside a phony transfer! Your Honor, you doctored the logbook! Damn it, Captain! You coerced the doctor! Consider yourself in contempt! Colonel Jackson, did you order the code red? 
Yeah. You don't have to answer that question. I'll answer the question. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You to. want answers? I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Uh, I love that movie very much. Uh, um, uh, so yes, uh, this this was an example, uh, and this is a little bit old, but now you see a lot of these renewal. Um, there is a speech to gesture and different project. It's really interesting to see all this work uh, going. But the, the translation is you take something, text and speech, and be able to generate from that. Um, the other, so when I think of translation, what it is, is the process of changing data from one modality to another, but also keep uh, the link. And so, and this, uh, where, the translation relationship can often be open-ended and subjective. And that's one thing we'll discuss also on Thursday, is one of the big challenge with translation, which is true. I, I, I told you uh, alignment uh, is related to multimodal and multi-view, which is also related to machine translation. Um, but, but this is true from any translation, like language to language, or also like speech generation. These are all translation problem. And they all come with the big challenge of evaluation will be a big challenge when you do any translation. So when you look at the translation, two ways or two approaches, maybe the slightly older way will be, but also very interesting uh, way. And I think you should visit, it's kind of more the non-parametric way of looking at translation where I have a, a, a test time. I'm going to look at like example from my uh, training and maybe to like the, the more, the classic, the most classic of these will be nearest neighbor. That's the most classic non-parametric model. But the translation, there's a lot of interesting work in parametric approaches, trying to reduce the number of parameters sometime also uh, and see generalization between training and testing. So these are two examples. Let me show one last example. This one is my work, is our work, uh, not my work, as you know, uh, students are the one doing the work. Uh, but I'm very excited about this work about translating uh, from language to motion. Uh, so I, 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 I'm uh, uh, originally I spent seven years of uh, in uh, Los Angeles, and I had the mini dream at that point that I could take a movie script and create a first version of the movie just by looking at the movie script. And so you can see the description the actor move and jog, or the person step forward, then turn around and, and move forward again. Uh, let me play it again, uh, just to be sure. Oh, I think there's a problem with the animation. I apologize for that. Uh, anyway, so this is an example. Uh, I will fix this for the slide. Um, the other, uh, so this is translation, but there is also the aspect of fusion where you bring the information and try to infer something novel, something new, uh, something about the sentiment maybe over time. So fusion is probably the oldest of the, the challenges. Uh, in fact, when uh, I started my PhD a long time ago, um, if you ask what was multimodal research at this point, you could almost summarize it with early fusion and late fusion. And then the question was just, which of the two did you use? Early fusion? Ah, or oh, well, did you try late fusion? Oh, you tried late fusion? Did you try early fusion? So it was very early. Uh, but now these days, we, we, the, the portfolio is much larger. But it's still really interesting. Early fusion, the idea is that the modalities are, are going to be concatenated early on. And then your model is going to learn, hopefully, how to bring these together. So you're kind of making it uh, with the hypothesis that you can't build, uh, you can't uh, uh, train or learn your process unless you bring it up early on. So that means that there are some very low level, you should use early fusion when there's some very low level multimodal uh, phenomena happening, that there is something very, like people are just, increasing their voice and moving at the same time, very low level. The late fusion is the idea that I need to do some processing internally in, in one, each modality before I try to make my fusion. 
Uh, and if I try to do it too early, it's, uh, and, and you have to remember that at this point, the data sets were much smaller. That, that's part of the reason uh, you had this. So now these days, there's a lot more approaches uh, to do that. Uh, in the course, a lot of the course will be on deep uh, neural architectures and all of its variants. But we're also going to discuss uh, kernel-based approaches. And the part that I personally like very much is graphical models. I love their interpretability. Also, the fact that you can bring domain knowledge into these architectures. So I think it's good to visit them as well. The last challenge uh, that I want to discuss is co-learning. The intuition behind co-learning, uh, the, the, the main intuition there, is that um, we talked up to now about all of these problems where we bring all this uh, multimodal information together or that we're translating it. But there are cases where the problem, the most interesting, or at least for that person, the most interesting problem is unimodal. It's possible the problem is unimodal by itself. Let's say it's um, object detection in an image. I want to detect the best possible detector and the most generalizable to any kind of label, uh, class label or object labels. So it's a very unimodal problem. But maybe there is something from other modalities that could help me at training time to be better in my task, in my unimodal task. I'm going to use multimodal information at the training time to help me uh, and so that at test time I'm best, I'm better or better, best. And these co-learning cases are usually the most useful when there's an issue with, um, where there's a problem with the um, uh, limited amount of data. Uh, and so maybe there's not as much data annotated yet uh, for my task. And so that's why you will see them a lot more as few shot learning kind of scenarios. So this is co-learning and you could imagine doing it both way. Language could help vision, but vision could also help language. And then suddenly you have this uh, two-way co-learning and this has a name and that was in the multi-view setting. This was called co-training. Uh, so co-training with uh, Tom Mitchell being one of the co-author of the original paper. So, so these are examples of co-learning. And the big challenge with co-learning is when you have this second modality helping you, is how much pairing, how strong do you know that this second modality is linked with that first modality? How strong is that link, that pair, pair data? And for people who do machine translation, you know also like, do you have a pair, very strong pairing where almost every word, you know what other word uh, is in the other language or which sentence and these, uh, uh, the, the, the translation, or you could have it like what could be called non-parallel or what I personally prior, weekly uh, parallel is, is the idea that you have maybe a corpus of language sentences and a corpus of uh, French sentences, English and French sentences, and then, but you don't have exactly which one is which with, but you know that they're related. So that's weak, and you have the same in multimodal. You have a bunch of images and, and you have the text, and you have just only at maybe at the corpus. So you have a spectrum, again, of being very strongly paired to weakly spare. And so one example for that is um, how do you learn language embedding? Uh, so uh, I'm talking right now, and how do I encode my words into something that would be useful maybe for emotion recognition? And so um, the idea here is that um, I will, um, I want to learn this. And if I have infinite amount of data, I have a large amount of corpus, um, I, I think probably you can do it just from language itself. Uh, but, and, and for text corpus, like written corpus, there's been a lot of it. But for spoken, there's maybe, let's say, fewer of this. There's still quite a bit, but let's say, for the purpose of this example, let's suppose there are few of it or fewer of it. So then I would say, but when I speak, 
there, it's not only about my language, but it's also about my gesture. It's also about my tone of voice. So can I use it during training, this extra information to be able to prove? But at test time, I'm only gonna have, I will only have language. So the trick here is I'm gonna use the, the idea of translation, where I do end up taking uh, from the verbal and I will translate it in an intermediate representation that will be used to finally generate the visual and so this is supposed pair data, but I will also do it with what's called a cyclic loss, which is say, not only did I take something like today was a great day and try to generate the visual, but that needs to be able to regenerate what was originally there. And the reason for that, I wanna do that, is, is that internally that intermediate representation, I need to be sure that it contains everything that was in today. I don't want to lose anything that's there. And see if I was to do only the one way, I may end up having an intermediate representation that's a lot closer to my target. And there's some interesting work on this that shows that often these intermediate representation are closer to the target than the source. But if by putting the cyclic and suddenly you have this, so to be sure that they also look very much like the input. And then at test time, what's really nice is that you can forget about the multimodal and maybe on a small data set, train for this uh, on a task like sentiment analysis or anything. And what was really interesting in the results of this is that this worked almost as much as a multimodal, uh, like having multimodal both at training and testing. So that was really int interesting. So this is the uh, high level view uh, of five. I, these are not the unique. And I really welcome your feedback when you think about it. And uh, one of the uh, reading assignment will be this survey paper. Uh, not all of it will splitting in two. Um, but yeah, uh, think about this, like what are the interesting challenges? And this is a draft of the taxonomy that came from these uh, example of what are the sub challenges in multimodal research. And what's great with multimodal research is that these examples are applicable with many applications. Up to now, I may have emphasized a lot more affect and emotion. Part of it is, is a good part of our research in my group is in that topic. But uh, if you ask me what really started the renewal, the new part of multimodal, is really the aspect of, uh, of what some people would call language and vision research. Uh, and so looking at media description as an example is like how image captioning or video captioning and visual question answering. There is also have been very good and very strong work that I, if anything, started earlier. If you ask me, I will say affect recognition had been there for a while. Uh, and multimedia had done a lot of work uh, and, um, and there was a, quite a renewal also there and in affect uh, with the 2010 with multimodal and media description. Although you can find some example as early as 2001 for image captioning, it really started, it had a big boost in 2010-11. So, so this is what we are there. We're here for this kind of course. Uh, that's our goal for this. So my goal is to spend the next, uh, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes to also go through the course syllabus and also share with you um, what we believe is going to be a very engaging way of studying this research. Um, so for this, I really want to uh, go for the course syllabus, but also share with you our vision, just a second, our vision for this, uh, because we want this to make it engaging. And I know with the world of being virtual and remote, it can be challenging. So the three main paradigm for this course, and although the grades are maybe not reflecting all the importance of each of them, but, uh, but they, I think all three of them are equally important. But from a grading perspective, you're gonna see one of them is clearly bigger. Uh, and it's, it's a personal choice uh, in designing this course. But I think all three of them are really important. One is course lecture participation and just in the in general, the course lecture. I'm talking, I'm talking a lot uh, and that's part of lecturing. Um, and I'm gonna share with you um, our view uh, of how to uh, assess 
the course participation in this and uh, um, we call them lecture highlights and I'm going to talk about it in a little bit. The goal was to not overwhelm you with extra homeworks but still have a way to be sure that you both uh, listen and understand the lectures and more importantly if you have also questions about the lectures that you're able to share those questions. So we're going to talk about how exactly we evaluate this. The other aspect is this discourse. Uh, one thing I should mention, this course is best suited for students in their third semester. This is the best, uh, third, third and plus. <laughs> third, four, five, six, seven, ten. I don't know if any of you are in the 10th semester. Uh, but yeah, uh, third semester is definitely the best. First semester is possible. Uh, and I'm going to discuss in a little bit, but a lot of this course is the idea that you not only going to learn the basic and the core about multimodal machine learning, but I really want you also to understand and, and really understand and explore the, the state of the art on this topic. And, and so that's why I'm calling it, it's a little bit more of an advanced course. Um, so the reading assignment is one of the learning paradigm for that. And, and we, we taught a lot about it. Uh, the initial version was, let's have every student read 30 papers this semester. <laughs> I don't see your facial expressions, but uh, I, I can imagine that would be a lot. So what we decided to make it more interactive is to create within the group what we call study groups. These will be about nine or 10 students uh, working together so that they can learn together. And how it is, is that we're going to give every, uh, for every reading assignment, we're going to give three papers and each student will have one of the paper and then they, they're going to learn about, the, they will learn about the other papers by, uh, by helping each other through some kind of chat base uh, or some uh, uh, discussion forum to, to help each other. So uh, we're giving the details in a little bit, but Reading the state-of-the-art uh, papers is important, and I think that's one of the learning paradigms. The core of this is the course project. I, I value very much uh, practical learning and getting you to learn uh, this, and I'm, we're going to scaffold this problem because this is a very uh, big piece. Um, one big warning for anybody on their first semester in graduate study or undergrad student. I have a warning uh, for you. Uh, and that may be true for uh, later, but it's usually specifically for first year students or undergrad, is sometime uh, we're really homework driven. Like a homework deadline is on Friday, we start on Wednesday or Thursday the homework. And then two days, you crank it and that's enough. That's not, that will not be true for this class. Uh, there is, I've been very careful to reduce the number of homework, but each homework, these, grade, these course project, you can't just wait until two days before. And, and you need to start two weeks, two weeks in advance to work. And that's why these are team projects, so you work, and you should plan to work and meet with your team at the minimum once a week uh, for the rest of the semester to really get things uh, going. I'm going to give more details, but a course project, the goal at the end of it is to create research that potentially could be submitted in a conference like ICML uh, or uh, any of the conferences you want. Now, I, I know when I say ICML, oh my God, my grade is gonna, will be based on me having an ICML paper accepted. No, 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 no. The goal is to explore. Research only work maybe 15, 20% of the time. So, uh, but exploration, you learn a lot through that and then you can move and move. So your grade is not gonna be based on like accuracy level or how good you are, no. Uh, it, it, the base is the idea of doing the research and understanding why it works and why it does not work. And we'll discuss a little bit that. We're going to really help you scaffold the whole process. So this is the idea of the course project at the high level, but we're going to go in more details in a second. But uh, what I wanted to share is like this course is designed. Don't take this class if you can't 
read attentively 10 papers. That's the bare minimum. I'm not gonna go, I will not go lower than this. I, this is the lowest I'm able to go and still have a very stimulating pay, uh, course. Um, 10 papers that you le learn. You may have questions about it. That's why you have a study group. You don't need to read these papers and understand everything right away. Well, you're gonna work together for that. But you need to read them and take the time more than reading like uh, in diagonal. You really need to read in-depth 10 papers. Enough to read them to explain it to your friends, uh, to your other people in your study groups. You should have a minimum aspect of machine learning. You should know, uh, uh, you should have taken one of the machine learning course here at uh, CMU or before that. Um, and within most of the latest machine learning, there's often an aspect of deep neural network. So you should have done some experience like with like PyTorch or something like this. If you had none of this, this can be a challenging course for you. It's not impossible, but it, it is um, uh, more challenging. Uh, and you have to be motivated to try something new and get a very high quality course project uh, because that's the, the, the cornerstone of this. So we spent a lot of time over the last five, six years to kind of define what would be a good way to scaffold the course project to make it good and easy, but also simulating. So we made it in uh, uh, four main uh, steps. Um, so one is a pre-proposal. This is very soon. So you already have a homework on Thursday and, and it's due for next Tuesday. So uh, next Tuesday, well, I'm gonna talk about it in a little bit. But the goal is in two weeks from now, you already have your team and we're gonna help you finding teammates. Uh, we have a really cool uh, thing uh, on Thursday uh, next week, uh, fun thing we're gonna try also for teammates. But by, 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 um, by two weeks from now, you know which data set you want to work on, you know which task you're likely to work on and which teammate. It's possible that you may not have teammates and then we'll help you but most of you expect like at least 90% to have teams, uh, hopefully 100%, but if not, we'll help you. Um, whoops, sorry for the cursor. Um, the, the next milestone, almost a month later, is the proposal. At that point, you had your team and uh, you, will do, you will do your, your proposal. Like, like that's what I wanna work on. And there's two things that are needed for there. One, is a literature review. So often I see students working on a topic, they found one paper. Oh, that's so cool. Let me do this, this, and this with that one paper. No, I want you to take the time, read about it, read other papers, gather at least 10, 12, maybe 15 papers around this. So that's, that's what you need to. And then that, at that point, you're gonna, you will look at your data set and start doing unimodal analyses on this, just to see what the data looks like. Too often I see people, they're like, this is a data set, I downloaded it, I ran the code of someone else, and I made a small modification. But people sometimes don't take the time to look at the data itself. So I think it's very important. So that's the first step. The key aspect after that is the midterm. At that point, you will implement state of the art in that field. Uh, at least one, maybe depending on the size of your team, maybe two or three of these models, you will implement them. But the goal of implementing them is not just to get like accuracy and all this. What I really want is do error analysis, like really understand why are they not working? What makes it like, that will give you ideas uh, to where to go with this. And so that is really important. That's a key thing. And finally, the fun part is like, okay, I have the state of the art. I know the previous work. I know my data. Now let me try two or three new ideas, depending on the size of your group, maybe up to four ideas. But yeah, let's go new ideas. I mean, some of them, most of them are not going to work, but let's try. That's what research is about. And that's what the last part of the project is. So I'm very excited about this. Um, some guideline we strongly suggest, it's not a requirement, but I strongly suggest to have two modalities in your data, language and vision and visual. Uh, the reason for that is the course has a big component around that. 
and also the community has done a lot of work around that so so i will suggest now if you realize there's some other data set that don't have it it is possible uh, to go beyond that let's say self-driving cars or or i don't know brain imaging or something but but let or acoustic or audio but talk with your ta uh, uh, about this or about the instructors about me and the tas the teams three four and five and i strongly suggest teams of four and five we saw them as working the best we tried for a while teams of one you know what happens with a team of one the team of one is mostly someone who do already their own research and they end up like just tweaking it for this course um, that does happen unfortunately uh, and also what's really nice with the the team is that you're gonna you will brainstorm together i get ideas so it's really good dynamic I, we found that three four and five were some of the most productive team and also we we have a, we'll have almost 120 students so um we also need to scale uh with this uh the project should explore something novel on the modeling side these are the three two or three or four ideas that you will explore and that i there's a lot of beautiful deadlines coming out at the end of this class uh, I, I forgot NACL, if you're going to make it, that's, that's a little bit tight. But there will be I, ACL, HKI, ICML. If you wait a little bit longer, ICMI, face and gesture, the uh, triple, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of very interesting. So on Thursday, I'm going to share some ideas, also some existing uh, projects that were done. Um, and uh, we will share some GPU resources um, for you. Uh, it's not infinite, uh, these resources, um, but we're, um, we'll, we'll share some of it um, so you can do your project. So in the short term, there are four other deadlines before the main big deadline of uh, in two weeks. Next, on Thursday, I'm going to share some multimodal data set and topics and application. Now, you have a homework to do. Either you do it on Friday before the Labor Day weekend, or you do it during the Labor Day weekend. Uh, but on Tuesday, what I need from each of you is your data set preference, your project preference. What, what do you want to work on? What is the topic? We're going to share the instruction via Piazza really soon for that. Um, if you are, and I'm going to talk about the wait list in a little bit later, uh, but uh, if you're on the wait list, I strongly suggest that you still submit uh, this. If you really want to take the class, you also submit your project preference uh, so that we are sure that we get everyone uh, in this. The Thursday, we're gonna, we'll have a really fun team formation. Um, if you already have your team, you already know these are the people I work, work with, um, you're, 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 you, you don't have to join, but we'll have this, uh, it's called Gather Town. Uh, we're gonna have this Gather Town uh, to, to help with team formation. And then by Wednesday, you should have your team, you should have the data set and the task. It is important equal contribution. I want all of you to work on this and you are the best to help us monitor this. So if early on at the proposal, you see that there was a, this is confidential. A lot of time when someone do, is not participating as much, is that there's another factor. It's very rare that someone is not participating just because they don't want to or something. There's often other factors. So the earlier you tell us, the earlier we can contact them and then work with them. And often we find great solution and then things goes well afterward. But don't wait for the final. By the time it's the final, this is not the time to tell us, hey, this person never helped. This is late, so do it early on. Here's how we, we, uh, we uh, put the schedule for uh, the lectures. The introduction for this week and the next two weeks after that are both the basic, with the build, basic building block, both on the learning side for week two and on the unimodal side for week three. And then week four and five are, will be a lot more about representation and we're gonna, we'll start touching a little bit alignment, but a lot more on representation. Finally, week six, no lectures, because this is the first big deadline. 
and we will use the lecture time to help you if you have any questions but i really want to work you you work hard on your uh at this point week uh so we these are the intermediate uh, deadlines that comes with it week seven is when we continue alignment and start looking at other things other than the deep neural architectures. Uh, so we're going to look at the probabilistic graphical models. Uh, we'll look at different variants of neural architectures and also reinforcement learning. We'll do fusion and new directions that uh, every year there's some new things and we're packing quite a bit in that. Uh, and then we have the midterm. It's a few weeks before Thanksgiving. And there, at that point, if you remember, you're implementing the uh, presentation, the midterm presentation. By the way, all of the proposal presentation, midterm presentation, and final presentation, they, these deadlines come in two parts, a report and a presentation itself. The report, it goes directly to the TA and I, and we're gonna, we're, we will uh, grade it and give you a lot of feedback. Uh, but also for the proposal, uh, for the presentation, we will use peer feedback. We will get feedback from other students uh, as well for there. So for this, we'll get other feedback from other students to give you about your project and the TAs. Uh, one thing I did not mention, each team for their project, you will have one TA, which is going to be, which will be your primary TA. Meet as often as you want with your TA. They love working with students on their projects. At the minimum, you will meet at least three times at the minimum with each uh, with your primary TA. Once will be uh, after, uh, which will be uh, after your pre-proposal. Another one, which will be around that week after your proposal and another one after your midterm around that time. And so it's really important to meet with them as often as you can. And we're also gonna create some kind of discussion groups on, uh, on the Piazza if you have questions and just wanna talk with your team and to you. Um, there's, we have, we're, we're lucky to have guest lectures uh, and we're leaving a lot more space in the last few weeks because the course project is very central uh, to this and the final project is due on Friday. So the course grades, 16% uh, for the lecture participation, uh, the reading assignment. Uh, we're gonna give more details about these two. Um, and then the uh, core of it is on the course project itself. So what do I mean by lecture participation? And we, we spend a lot of time on this to make it useful, uh, training you, and also hopefully don't take too much time. So starting next week, you don't have to do it for this lecture and next lecture, but starting week number two, you will have for every lectures, uh, and there's a total of 20 of these lectures uh, because we have a few time like Thanksgiving and others where there's no lectures explicitly. Uh, for the 20 main lectures, you have to take what's called a highlight. What is the highlight of that lecture? And the highlight, the idea is for every 30 minutes, so the first 30 minutes, the next 30 minutes, and the last 20 minutes-ish, so it can, sometimes I go over, so like 20-ish minutes, for each of these segments, what is the main take-home message? What is the one sentence take-home message? So if you see, it should not take so long. You should have maybe that Google form, it's most likely a Google form, really, and just, every 30 minutes, just write the main, or what I would suggest, have another document and just put all your notes when I talk, like what is the important thing so you can revisit later, and just write one take-home message. This take-home message cannot be just keywords that you got from the lecture slides, okay? Uh, it's like the, the, the take-away cannot be a multimodal representation or five, like it should be a full, sentence like uh, like a full long sentence uh, of it or a few like two or three sentences but um, optionally what we we realize is we also will have uh, a place for you to ask questions because it's 120 students it can be very uh, hard for you to ask questions during the lectures 
So you can ask questions there in this form. And any question that um, we're going to, the deadline is 42 hours after the lecture. So everybody, and that also allow you if you're traveling or something, you have 42 hours from the end of the scheduled time. So 4.50 p.m. So you have until 10.40 a.m. on Thursday uh, to, and if it is uh, the Thursday lecture, you have 10.40 a.m. On, on Saturday to watch the lecture and fill that form. What we will do is we will grade the, the, the highlights, uh, which will be very lenient as long as it's a summary. You can copy, we will check if you're too close from other students. Uh, so be careful on that. Uh, but, uh, but, um, but the idea also, if you write the questions, we will do our best to answer as many of them. Now, we don't know, this is the first time we do this. If we ended up with 2,000 answers, or not, not, I don't know how many, uh, I don't know if we we're gonna be able to. So we are, we're looking at option to look at popular questions uh, to answer them. But we'll do as much as we can to answer them either on Piazza uh, or during the next lecture. If for some reason we did not manage to answer your question, at any point in time, use Piazza to ask any other follow-up questions? This is the place to use that. So this is lecture highlight. The reading assignment, as I said, we really wanted you to learn a lot while doing as little work as possible. Not, uh, that's not exactly that, but I didn't want you to read three papers. You're always welcome to read all three of them. I really hope you can. But at the minimum, I want you to read one in depth. Enough that you are able to create a summary and answer questions from the other students. And so the idea here, you have a study group of nine or 10 students. Uh, I think they, we created them already or they will be created soon on Piazza. And then you will have a discussion on the Piazza uh, about the papers. And so you can use this discussion for two, for two things. One is ask question about the paper you read because maybe because you have other people who read it. And then the other one is, uh, is to ask question about the other papers that are there. For the first week, we are trying something. We are not forcing people, we're not assigning people on papers. What it means is we, you have a study group of nine or 10 people and we will let it to you to pick whichever paper you want with the hope that it is uniformly distributed. If it does not work, then the backup is we will assign people randomly to papers uh, and then you can help each other. So we're trying a first version. So the idea here is the grade will be about the reading assignment, like your summary that you created and also the discussion. We expect that you at least participated twice. You will have details instructions for the lecture allied and the reading assignment really soon on Piazza. So the last part of this is I'm going to give you the pointers because now these days it's impossible to get. Uh, we use Canvas in a very limited way, uh, I will say. Um, so uh, so the, uh, the, um, the Canvas, um, Okay, next. Okay, will be okay. Yeah, I will uh, tell you about this uh, answer. Oh, there was a question recently uh, I got, but I will answer that in a second. Um, so the um, the canvas is uh, Zoom and Piazza and Gradescope. All of it, the links are there, and also all the recorded sessions will be on the canvas. It will be in uh, something called Panapto recordings. We'll put them as soon as we can within a few hours of the class also. Zoom is what we use now for all the live and Panopto is for the offline version. So the Panopto is what we'll use for that. And the both the links of both are on Canvas. In Piazza, this is probably the core of what we will use. We'll use Piazza for any announcement, any questions you have, and then the reading assignment also We'll use that uh, as well, uh, like the study groups. 
um, will put on the uh, project instruction and course syllabus. Uh, the grade scope is what we use to uh, uh, when you uh, have your project assignment reports. This is where you will uh, submit this. And we also created an external course website. This one has a lot of the same information as you see on Piazza, but this is a course website that is accessible by all students. And also there's a version of the lectures that will be put there. This is a version of the lecture uh, with uh, being sure that any um, personal information, anything that could be linked by any current students will be removed and then uh, to be sure that uh, external course, uh, the external course version is only the thing that, that that's me talking about things. Uh, that's that's what's uh, there. Uh, okay, and I know there is currently about seventy plus people on the wait list, and a lot of you want to be uh, in the course. Uh, the good news is that there will be the spring semester. We have a new edition of the multimodal machine learning. Previously, if you didn't get it in the fall, you had to wait the next fall. The next year, uh, Jonathan Bisk will be teaching the multimodal machine learning. I will not be teaching, but I will probably do one or two guest lecture, I'm sure. But the spring, so if it's the same course, it's probably going to be a better version uh, because you bring some new version, new, new ideas to this. Uh, so spring, if you can do it, uh, it, it, we have the version in this. So the last slide I, I have, uh, the two last slides I, I have right now. No, the, this is the last slide. Um, so for, do you have one homework? We're going to, we will post the, um, the, uh, the uh, details soon. Um, uh, but there's one homework is the project preferences. You'll get more, uh, you'll get more details. Uh, in a little bit uh, about this, probably on Piazza. It will be definitely on Piazza, but you have to uh, do this by Tuesday. Uh, and we will have more details about the topics uh, and everything uh, there.